a principal with the Community Land Use and Economics Group. Um, I'm also a senior researcher with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, um, which is a national nonprofit organization that focuses on building um, strong, reliant local economies. Um, in my spare time, I'm also a professor for Goucher College. I teach a class in historic preservation economics. Ben, who are you? Well, I am Ben Muldrow. I am a partner with Arnett Muldrow and Associates. We're an urban planning firm that's based down in Greenville, South Carolina, and I'm proud to to call Delaware my home now. And uh, we work with small and medium communities all over the country and in fact, all over the world with uh, both downtown revitalization. And one of our biggest uh, focuses is on uh, community branding and helping a community to both preserve the character that they they love and also help to, to kind of get folks on board as they move forward and, and uh, reshape their future. So um, I am thrilled to, to be with you today, Kennedy. So we are going to jump right into the presentation and, um, you know, as we talk about creative solutions that are born out of crisis, I think the, the big thing that um, I was excited about the opportunity to do today, Kennedy, was be able to just have a conversation with you and uh, talk with you a little bit about uh, what we're seeing out there, out there the adaptations, adaptations that, that um, um, we see, we see and, and and what we're going to expect yeah. moving forward. So we've got five topics that we're going to try to cover today. Um, changing roles of Main Street. What will promotion be? How to uh, events and and kind of that that marketing change and and what's that going to look like moving forward? Uh, the technology gap and and how we might be able to fill that. Economic reinvention. Um, redesigned design, some of those uh, kind of interesting things that we've seen born out of, of need and out of desperation, and then finally wrap it up with lasting impacts. Um, so let's jump right in, Kennedy. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the changing roles of Main Street. Uh, I think I know I've always kind of described, especially our, our both Main Street as a place, but also Main Street as an organization. We have these small grassroots economic development entities that are expected to be kind of the Swiss Army knife of the community. And um, and I think that with a, a situation like a global pandemic, we have really seen uh, the versatility and the ability to adapt as an organization. Yeah, very true. I mean, it's not it's the organizations themselves that are going to uh, be adapting, but also the districts themselves are going to be adapting. I think that what Main Street as a place will be um, going forward is going to be a little bit different. We have a glut of commercial space coming online, both from businesses in downtowns that have failed, but more particularly from big box stores, national retailers, uh, Class B and Class C shopping malls that are all um, closing up and likely not to come back and accru accruing a lot of debt. So there's going to be a glut of space in the community and community leaders are going to have to deal with that. And it's going to be important for Main Street, the, the, the organization, to be advocating for Main Street, the place going forward as it kind of carves a new role in the community. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that I think has emerged um, that we didn't necessarily, we weren't necessarily equipped for, but Main Street has kind of become the community therapist. And uh, oftentimes, you know, our Main Street managers are, they've always had to deal with that front line of our business community, <laughs> which isn't always the, the happiest per se. But, um, you know, I think that they really have been put into a place where um, they're having to serve that role of, of emotional support to the members of the community. I'll never forget one of my um, managers down in Mississippi uh, told me, she said, I, I have a business owner, a restaurant owner who we've been friends for decades. And um, she literally looked at me straight in the face and said, I, I understand you're trying to help, but you're still going to get a paycheck this week. Um, mm. What have you seen in terms of that kind of emotional support and maybe the need for additional tools or some of those just stories where you really feel like, wow, that is, that's what's great about these organizations is the ability to support one another. Yeah, it's very true. You know, I don't, I don't know if you know this, Ben, but I'm married to a psychiatrist and for years we've said, you know, we actually do the same thing. <laughs> Our jobs are kind of a lot alike. It's kind of problem solving and coaching and, you know, maybe occasionally some 
psychotropic drugs, whatever it might be. But um, uh, it's it's very true. I think that a lot of businesses who have kind of known intellectually for a long time, business owners, that they should have a you know a more robust web presence. Um, they should be using social media differently. They should be diversifying their markets a bit. Um, it was like a thing they were going to get around to, and now all of a sudden it's crashing down right in front of them. And um, they need a lot of handholding, a lot of encouragement, a lot of uh, technical assistance and guidance to know where to find these things. Um, and the way I think they're going to survive really is by having an organization that can kind of nurture and support them um, through this process that they're going through. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I've been excited about, and I know that that um, on our call today, we have a mixture of both um, Main Street communities there in Iowa, as well as communities that just rely on the support of the Iowa Downtown Center. But one of the things I've been really excited about is the very quick adoption of virtual meeting uh, technologies to allow both managers to better collaborate. Um, I can't tell you how many therapy sessions I've participated in with um, statewide managers, whether we're talking about, you know, the state of Missouri started uh, every single Wednesday morning getting together and just kind of talking through. And, and I truly believe that what we're starting to see is we're seeing a whole new realization of the power of the network. And I think that that peer-to-peer -peer support is really exciting. And I hope that that's something that we see that continues on. Um, one of the cool things we're doing, Kennedy, is we're actually doing um, a session once a month for all of the Main Street managers of the state of Michigan and the state of Wyoming. And they're actually meeting together. And it's kind of a cool dynamic to have such different uh, backgrounds and such different community dynamics, but being able to figure out the things that they share and then also figure out the challenges that are unique. It's been pretty therapeutic. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we we think about all the things that are probably going to come out of this as permanent changes, you know, like um, people aren't buying as many dressy work clothes because things are suddenly more casual and people are shopping online more and hopefully they're going to be shopping online from small uh, locally owned businesses. Um, but one of the things is I think that video technology has made it so people realize, yeah, I can jump on a call with anybody anywhere in the world. And for some reason, I think they didn't know they could have done that before, but now it's very, very real, and I think people are comfortable with it, and that's cool. That's cool. It's huge, absolutely. So the next role that we had kind of talked about is that evolving role as an advocate. I, I think a lot of times um, Main Street organizations were so busy being event programmers that they weren't necessarily able or or maybe they just didn't have the voice they didn't have the spotlight shown on the problems to be able to be that advocate so what are you seeing in terms of that that changing role or the enhanced role of main street as an advocate yeah i think this one is a really big and important one because i think the things that main street organizations and downtown revitalization organizations in general whatever kind they are uh, are going to need to advocate for is changing pretty quickly um i think that this um i mentioned just a second ago this problem with uh national retail chains um folding and that affecting shopping malls um it's going to affect uh, commercial backed mortgage securities in a big way and we could be on the brink of a kind of a you know a mortgage collapse like we had with the housing sector uh, 10 years ago uh, coming up with uh, commercial property so I think that the potential glut of um, sort of big box and shopping center space especially in uh, communities that have class B and class C shopping centers um, is going to be enormous and um, we're going to need people to advocate for organizations to advocate for let's rethink this as we start to sort of reshape our communities looking at the next 20 years and what we're taking away from this pandemic um, we really do need to concentrate economic activity uh, in a couple of core areas and not let it spread all over the you know the community and up and down the highways we need to think better about it so that we're um, making better use of our natural and economic resources um, we also need uh, Main Street organizations and downtown groups to advocate for things that uh, we're finding that businesses need uh, by going through this pandemic. One of the things that I've been following very closely at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance um, are communities and even states that are now uh, suddenly putting uh, caps on the fees that uh, meal delivery services can charge um, because 
you know, in addition to the basic delivery commission, there are fees for, you know, taking telephone orders versus web-based orders and all kinds of things. Um, and it's adding up to 30, 35% of what a total order is. Um, wow. And if a restaurant is only making, you know, 10% margin on its food, um, they're going broke. Um, and there are a number of restaurants that are really screaming about this now. So, you know, there are probably 30 or 40 communities in a couple of states uh, and some counties uh, that have pretty quickly capped delivery fees at about 15%. Um, so we need organizations to advocate for things like that. And finally, I think that there's an important role for Main Street organizations um, in negotiating win-win uh, solutions between landlords and tenants. Um, commercial tenants so that um, you're finding ways to switch to a percentage lease or you're taking lease payments that the business owner might have met and sticking them at the end of a lease term and advertising the cost that way. Um, but finding those win-wins so that you, you know, sort of break the impasse where they're not talking to each other and really finding a way to, uh, to come together. Right. And, you know, one other thing, Kennedy, and I don't, I mean, this seems like a small thing, but, um, I'm sure you've come across this before where these main street organizations and, and even times, you know, municipal governments themselves being so unbelievably hesitant to promote any individual business ever. And right. I feel like this pandemic has broken that hesitation and has opened the door to realizing that these these entities absolutely should be able to help their businesses both survive and thrive. And I'm excited about this changing role of the the our organizations as economic development advocates for the business community. And, and like I say, it might seem small, but I do think that being able to shout the stories of your own businesses is going to be big for us moving forward. Oh, I, I totally agree. I mean, I've, I've also been tracking uh, communities that um, – uh, are setting up small business assistance, financial assistance programs, grants and loans and loan guarantees and things like that. And every day when I open up all of my, you know, tickler files of articles that have come across about these, every single story is about we need to help small businesses. We're setting up a program to help small businesses and downtown businesses. And I'm never hearing that kind of thing about the national chains. I'm hearing it all about small businesses and sentiment has turned in such a major way that I think now everybody recognizes, yeah, these these businesses are crucial to our community's economies, and we really do have to get behind them and tell their stories. Absolutely. And to actually segue off of something that you had just mentioned, um, one of the other things that I have found to be very interesting is Main Street organizations seem to be bouncing around the idea that they might be able to be a delivery solution provider for their district and possibly even create an alternative revenue stream for the organization while providing a service for the viability of the businesses in their district. Have you seen or heard of any kind of locally based delivery options for districts? Um, I've seen a few and I've seen them kind of born out of different uh, initiatives. There's a guy in Kansas City who's working on one, um, but he came from a staffing back um, um, a background. He was a, an HR staffing person for an IT company. And so he saw this need for uh, staff who could be specialized in doing deliveries like that. There's some people in Nebraska that are doing something uh, based on trying to find jobs for their kids. And so it was born that way. So I'm seeing like, I've seen probably six or eight of these kind of pop up. Um, and I think they're all beginning to gel now and have some similarities. But, you know, we've been talking about the importance of offering deliveries for downtown businesses for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So now I think it's going to happen. And uh, I think probably in a month or two, we're going to see, you know, a few dozen models around the country. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then the final in this category, that kind of changing role is, um, and I know that we have battled with this for uh, years and years and years, is this idea of the Main Street organizations, downtown organizations, truly being able to step up to the economic development table and carry with them that that economic development credibility, this idea of true economic support um, with the, the changes that we've seen funneling um, PPP through SBA and, and kind of streamlining some of that process. Um, do you feel like this is an opportunity organizationally for our downtown organizations to really emerge as true economic development engines? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, and we've known that this was the case for decades. You know, we worked on the, uh, Josh, my business partner, and I worked on the Main Street Refresh for the National Main Street Center a few years back. And in doing surveys of, you know, hundreds of communities to sort of see what their needs were, they all talked about the need to, for their organizations to have a bigger role in business development, financial incentives, financing property development, you know, the whole, the whole shebang. But you know, the organizations were constrained by uh, needing to generate revenue from promotional events, and so they just didn't quite get to it, and that created this um, chicken and egg thing where they then be began to be perceived as promotional organizations and not economic development organizations. I think one of the things this pandemic has done is sort of brought a, a hard stop in that chicken and egg cycle and uh, is focusing attention on the fact that, yeah, we need to really now uh, get things together downtown economically and make sure that we're, you know, gradually ratcheting up this balance between uh, sales activity and property value and keeping it at a good healthy level. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've kind of seen is this, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've read Simon Sinek and, and Start With Why, you know, this whole idea of, of being able to identify those why motivators and the the we've always been so good tactically and we've always been so good at having the data and the hard numbers but it, it is important for us to acknowledge that in america in 2020 when you lead with details and data you actually stimulate the skeptical mind and and what we have done is we have created this unbelievable spotlight on the emotional stories of small business in America and and the real people behind why we pour this passion into our, our downtowns and our main streets. And and it gives us that opportunity to really tell the full story. And, and you know, although it, it's born out of real hardship, I think I am I am excited about that opportunity to shore it up. So um, it, it's it is an interesting time, but you know, in kind of telling that story and being able to to promote, that's that perfect segue into our next section. What will promotion be? Um, we have all dealt with the the idea of. Um, I kind I kind of said early on that we can't main street our way out of this pandemic you know typically it's like you a community has a hardship and then we we gather together and we festival our way out of it and it's amazing what you know a, a beer on the street or a funnel cake can do to to help people come back together and and those have kind of been removed for us so uh what are you seeing in terms of the evolution of events and promotion? yeah well, I mean, I think that there's, you know, a whole lot of uh, head scratching right now about it and people trying to think, what do we do? But some of the things that I, you know, are kind of coming out of it are things like um, self-driven activities that people can do downtown. They can do treasure hunts and uh, things that lead them from storefront window to storefront window. Um, talking about sort of who are their who are their core markets and if they can't bring people together physically how can they nonetheless get a message out to them how can they um, reach them in that way I'm finding that communities are kind of gravitating towards doing micro events and micro activities that might just be for you know third graders or just for people who live in this half of the district or whatever. Um, and that's kind of a good solution. You don't have big crowds uh, in the district, but you're able to really focus a message and be very specific. Um, I've also for a long time, as you as you know, I've been talking about this for years and years, have been a big fan of putting activity in storefront windows. And mm -hmm. I think you've got a, a, a video there that you can show that will- uh, I'm gonna it'll... I'm gonna advance to it real quick. Oh yeah, it's down the ways. Yeah, it's so absolutely this is... so cool. This is just a real simple thing. They have a video screens with these women's faces um, and uh, scarves hanging in front of them. And there's a little fan uh, that's hidden behind the uh, the screens um, and it just blows and you can see the, the scarves ripple. A relatively simple thing that you can do with video, um, but what it does is it puts motion and activity in that storefront window and people are just captivated by it. They will stop and watch it for 10, 15 minutes and wonder, you know, what's going on. Um, I've, I've never been, you know, a fan of having, uh, of trying to get all retail businesses and ground floor spaces because historically they never were like that. There were a mix of 
offices and retail and wholesale, but you can still make a window lively, um, even if it isn't a, a, a retail window. So I, I, I think we're going to see more use of things like that, uh, video technologies um, to create motion uh, along the ground, the ground floor level, and that's going to be very captivating to people. And tell yeah, stories. and you know some of the examples that I've got up. I mean, the the idea, and I think we've all seen this at this point of you know having concerts or having outdoor events where you have these these safe distance circles, and you know it it seems odd at first, but then there's also something kind of compelling about it, and um, both visually compelling and ju just from an experience standpoint. So finding ways to kind of integrate some of those. Um, we've got a great example that was shared from Austin with food trucks. And instead of having a food truck rodeo where it was like, hey, let's have a whole bunch of food trucks who come together and then everybody comes and eats. Instead, let's take advantage of the mobility of the food truck and create ways that we can send food trucks out to people. And, you know, that's a, a great kind of spin on that trend that we know has been so prevalent lately. Um, from there, the what they call the safe tables, a uh, couple different um, companies out there that are are creating these kind of movable <laughs> tables with inner tubes. And, and uh, you know, it, I think that it has been interesting to see that uh, as you would expect, we have been very creative at figuring out how to continue to drink in public. Um, right. And we'll actually hit on that a little bit later on. But um, there also are some very interesting designs. This is uh, one that's come out of uh, Virgin in, in uh, United Kingdom of a socially spaced event and concert venue where they're actually planning on building personalized concert decks and um, you will reserve a deck for a small group and kind of an interesting model where it's almost like everybody has a box seat and it's it's a neat dynamic it'll be interesting to see whether those uh, come to reality or not and then i think one of the other big things that i've seen as you know i'm a, a big fan of uh, telling your story and sharing your message and um, we had the privilege of working with the arkansas main street program and in kind of talking a little bit about integrating just a safe experience into being in your downtown and you know kennedy you really nailed it when you were talking about events and and how to to set those events up in a way that was more measured and what we're really shooting for is the safe, steady stream of customers so that you right. create kind of a reliable economy instead of that kind of festival influx where, I mean, how many times have we heard the businesses in a community complain about the 14,000 visitors to the festival because, quote, none of them are my customer. Right. So, you know, owning that message, I think, goes a long way for us. Um, anything else that you've seen that that's kind of exciting from from kind of an event standpoint, or you think, or do you feel like that kind of covers it? I, th I think that creativity is key at this point. Well, yeah, and I think the creativity, I mean, it's exciting to watch the new things that, you know, pop up on the Main Street listserv and on the point, and um, people are thinking of all kinds of crazy ideas. And I think that because a lot of Main Street organizations have been heavily invested in promotion for a long time. That's where creativity is going first, and I think we're going to see cool things happening. I heard I heard of something in um, a town in New York uh, last week that I thought was kind of cool. They had, since singing, you know, is potentially a risky thing now, they had uh, singers inside storefront windows um, with speakers that would go out onto the street, and you, as you walked by, they would just sing to you, and so you could oh, stroll down the cool. sidewalk, and yeah, and the entertainment was inside the building where it was safer so well, I think, and I've I think, good, yeah I've got good friends down in South Carolina that own kind of a craft beer and wine store and early on in all of this they started to uh, pair up with local chefs and they would do date night uh, packages so you do a curbside pickup and pick up food and pick up uh, a beer and wine pairing and then hop on to a curated zoom call 
where they would literally walk you through and kind of do a tasting event at home, which is, you know, a cool way to, to kind of take that, what can be seen as a sterile technology and really kind of make it a, an experience. So right. that's pretty cool. So um, from there, the next thing that I don't want to spend a lot of time on the technology gap, because I do think that that technology is the kind of thing that sometimes you can make our eyes roll back into our head, but there were a couple of things that really, really stuck out to us. Um, you know, the the Main Street America conducted a very, very detailed survey of businesses across America, and the the information that jumped out to me the most was two out of every three businesses surveyed. Now, you have to imagine these are the businesses who are proactive enough to respond to a survey and even with the community's most proactive two out of three had no way to get revenue online and that was absolutely staggering to me um yeah i i was also shocked by that when i saw that stat i i, I honestly couldn't believe it it's it's one of those things where um we have tried to tackle that uh, problem. We've actually created a a uh, library of tutorial videos that um, different state coordinating programs are offering for free to their businesses that walk you through the entire process of you know how do I pick my um, my platform for for payment? How do I manage my inventory? How do I deal with shipping? So uh, it's definitely not like the most exciting of videos, but it's that kind of vital toolkit to bridge that gap. Um, one of the cool things, and, and I think you probably know, um, my business partner is my oldest brother, but my middle brother who lives uh, there in Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, has worked directly with many businesses in the effort to get online quickly. And he told me a fantastic story of a local restaurant. They launched an online menu on Sunday night, the restaurant was closed on Monday, and by Wednesday night, they had done eleven hundred dollars in sales. Wow! Through the online portal. Why that makes so, you a believer? A absolutely. I mean, it's just one of those things where um, I think technology is on the side of small business right now, but we have to make sure that our business community has alternative revenue streams. It is not. We just no longer live in a world where opening a downtown business is, oh, well, all I'm going to do is sell straight out of the store. If you don't have some sort of back end shipping, if you don't have some sort of online sales option, it is a pretty difficult model to succeed at. Yeah, it, it's also it's it's uh, something that I've thought that Main Street businesses actually, if they were online, would have a significant edge. Uh, over, you know, national retailers and Amazon, everybody else, because one of the problems that national retailers have with their websites is the process of discovery. It's hard to get people to just sort of wander into new merchandise and discover something and understand it. Um, and Main Street business owners know their products inside and out. They know everything about them. And if they can translate that experience of personal knowledge to, um, you know, to their website, you know, that's that's far and above uh, more than anything that Amazon could ever do. I um, I met this guy in Texas uh, years ago. It was when the internet was relatively new. It was probably 20 years ago who had a scuba supply store and he had a webcam back then. Uh, it was like low res, like 480p or something, but he had a webcam in his <laughs> store. So you could always, you could go to his website and you could see what was going on in the store. And people would call him on the phone and they would say, I need a new regulator. What do you have in stock? And he would pick them up and take them over to the webcam and be talking to you on the phone. And it was fabulous because you, you really, this guy knew his stuff inside and out. When you picked what you wanted, you could see him box it right up then to, to send it to you. Um, and I always thought it was a wonderful way to translate that in-store experience online. And um, so I, I, I'm, I'm happy when I see uh, downtown businesses that are doing some of that, telling the story of their business, yeah. telling the story of some of their products. There's a guy who I've come across who um, uh, repairs cowboy hats, and he has this whole wonderful like story on his website about how he does it, and he has pictures. And of course, you want to buy a hat from him because he knows his stuff so well. 
Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the things that that you can come to imagine is if all of these businesses start to do their part and create those alternative channels, then that then opens up the door for our downtown organizations to truly create that localized marketplace, that that right. sales portal of sorts where, you know, we can truly take that I, I mean, imagine even doing virtual shopping events where it's almost like you could pull off a virtual art walk and send people virtual store to virtual store. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of cool things if you've got that foundation. So right. now the, the next part of the technology gap is what we're seeing in the, the evolving world of social media. Um, you know, I think that that it's kind of interesting how um, Facebook has definitely kind of solidified its place. Um, Instagram has become this kind of premium kind of content portal of sorts where um, there's there's a, a certain thing that, that kind of happens there. Um, TikTok has really blown up, <laughs> you know. Well, over, literally now too, yeah, but yeah. Absolutely, and um, you know, from a social media standpoint, I think the big thing that um, that I really want to reinforce with this is just that it is important for both our businesses and the stewards of our districts to understand that um, with the evolving nature of social media, you do have to put the time in to understand it. Um, you can't simply broadcast a message on Facebook and feel like you've communicated to your community. And um, it, it's kind of like I, I've come to this phrase that uh, an invitation is not engagement. And uh, I feel the same way about social. Broadcast is not connection. Mm -hmm. um, social allows for interaction, but explore those different avenues and figure out those ways that you can truly connect with all the facets of your community. Um, have you seen anything or been particularly uh, touched, uh, you know, about kind of the changing nature of social? I don't know that I would say touch. There are a couple of things that have kind of ticked me off a little bit, but um, yeah. and that is that I think that uh, that it's important to recognize that each of these different platforms sort of has its own audience, um, mm -hmm. just as we would say for different magazines and TV shows. And I see, um, it, you know, a lot of businesses who have kind of been lagging behind the curve, they immediately go to Facebook. That's like sort of the biggest and the most popular and they go there. And Facebook might be turning off Gen Z kids, you know, who are like, that is so my grandparents era. Um, so there really is some market distinction between the different platforms. And I think it's important to, um, to work with those and tap into those and so it's important to understand all of them which might mean that business owners uh, and downtown organizations need to have advisors uh, of all ages and different types in the community to help guide them in the right direction a absolutely i have been saying for years that um to me it totally makes sense for us to involve uh, high school students into the Main Street world with their social media prowess. I mean, right. they understand mediums and communication, uh, especially to their own demographics in ways that we do not. And um, and they truly are experts at it because they're crafting the industry. And right. it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Um, Real quick, before we move too far forward, we did have a question come in from Andrea. Um, she was wondering about the window that we shared. Where was that from? You know? Oh, I, I can't. I feel like saying Boston, but I can't really okay. remember. But gotcha. I, I, can, I can check on it later and if you shoot me an email. And, uh, and get it to you. Um, there yeah, was one thing that I, that I wanted to say about technology too before we go, and that is that um, you know, I think getting businesses online, getting a website is sort of a, a base that we need to work mm -hmm. towards for everybody. But there are all kinds of things happening very, very quickly in the world of technology. I, I saw this woman give a demonstration the other day. She has a company called something like 3D Forms or something. But she's basically creating uh, this body scanning technology so that people can have a, a passport avatar, she was calling it. So it's an avatar that has your body measurements because it's not going to be safe to go into stores and try on clothes for a while. 
So how do you figure out what a good fit is? But she's envisioning this being something that you not only take from store to store, it doesn't belong exclusively to the Gap or to the whoever, but it, 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 it like floats across all technologies and you can even use it in video games and other places where you might use an avatar. So I think we're gonna see many, many new interesting things happen like that. And you've got safe technology up here and that's another one where the technology is evolving quickly and it's important that Main Street businesses be on top of it. Absolutely. I think that um, seeing the pivots that we have seen with uh, different companies and, and kind of adopting both adopting safe technology, but then also, I mean, one of my favorite stories is a, um, a company called Sylvan Sport. They're out of Brevard, North Carolina, and uh, they make high end, um, I guess it their RV campers, like travel trailers, oh, yeah. sure. for sports enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's almost like a dome tent on a trailer, but it's built where you can carry your kayaks and you can carry your mountain bikes and, and all that kind of stuff in it. And, um, and just a really, really dynamic company. And as soon as, as COVID hit, they made a quick pivot. They started a whole subsection of their company called Sylvan Safe. They started making uh, custom, uh, foot door pulls, they started making, you know, the the counter um, guards and that kind of stuff. And just seeing that dedication, one of the cool things that they did, because they had the ability to make tents, they started to immediately make uh, triage tents for, you know, different, um, both yeah. testing centers and things like that. So being able to see the quick adoption, I think that we'll probably see, see uh, public hand sanitizer make its way into streetscapes. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so any of that that adoption, even the simple things like uh, touchless transactions, um, you know, figuring out ways to, uh, one question that somebody asked me is, are we gonna see downtown businesses move to buy swinging doors? So, you know, they just, they you can just push against them with your elbow, no matter what direction you're coming from. So kind of interesting dynamics that you wouldn't necessarily think about, but now all of a sudden, a global pandemic has led us to talk about the way that a door swings. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now it gets uh, fun. We start to dig into economic reinvention. And uh, this is the stuff where um, I'm kind of excited to hear from you on these. I'll kick the the first one off because I, I feel like it's something that I have seen a really interesting evolution over the past several years. Um, everybody that has ever dealt with uh, with downtown organizations knows the idea of the facade grant and uh, the idea of providing a grant to help somebody uh, renovate their facade and in hopes that it's going to spur kind of a, a chain reaction of investment. Um, one of the things that we have seen is kind of an evolution of a facade grant into a component grant. So it might be that in 2020, we are looking at awnings. And then in 2021, we look at signs. Um, and then kind of the further evolution of that is we've started to see communities move to vibrancy grants, small micro grants that are incenting color, activity, uh, any kind of vibrancy. I know Norfolk, Virginia did an amazing job with this. And it only makes sense that we see that evolve into safe based vibrancy. So micro dining pods, parklets, um, you know, this great way to see uh, adaptation in the public space. And I'm sure you've seen cool examples of of some of the byproducts of what a, a vibrancy grant might fund. Yeah, you know, I've seen it more in terms of um, sort of uh, business models uh, and innovation. I've seen communities give micro grants for things like websites and things like, yeah. um, you know, QR codes and, you know, turning your inventory into something that can be scanned. Um, those little pieces that can, by incentivizing business owners to make small changes, uh, can gradually get them there. I honestly think that throughout this whole pandemic, however long it lasts, a year, two, whatever that we're looking at, um, that we're that that there are going to be periodic times when businesses are suddenly going to need a different kind of support. And so it's important to have some flexible funding that you can make available for whatever the need might be, and to think through how is this going to serve us now, but also maybe serve us five years in the future. And can, is it, you know, how, you know, how to begin even planning for five or 10 years down the road. Um, but it, 
it absolutely can be done. Is the downtown going to be a better place because it has more color and better awnings and more businesses online? Absolutely. So right. um, this is That's the way that cool. we can that we can push things forward. Absolutely. So the next one is, is kind of big, uh, building ownership. Um, I, I know that one of the things that I have often lamented on is what I, I've felt like I called the death of the American merchant class, this old school day where you you owned your building and, and owned your first floor business and lived upstairs and, and you know, all of those dynamics. Um, you have already kind of mentioned that we are on the, the kind of forefront of a potential commercial mortgage collapse and kind of a a redefinition of the way that we think about building ownership. What can you tell us about this? What are you mm -hmm. seeing? What are you thinking? Uh, what are there? Are there fun yeah. opportunities or exciting opportunities that are yeah. going to come out of some hardship? We could. I could talk about this for two days. I think, and it's you know everybody be asleep after two hours, but I would enjoy it. But anyway, um, I'm seeing all kinds of things like um, you know business owners, building owners who are saying, you know what. I can't take the stress of leasing space to a retailer right now because I don't know if they're going to be viable or if they can pay their rent. So how would you like to buy your ground floor space as a condo? You know, mm. so business owner, you can have it. Um, I've seen places and this depends on the market, but I was talking to people in New York, New York, New York, um, about the fact that there are so many uh, high end retailers that are tanking right now. And this could be an opportunity to for a, uh, a sort of a land trust organization or a conservation fund to get in there and uh, buy those properties and then make them available uh, to independently owned businesses uh, at, a, at a subsidized price um, and help them control prices. So there's all kinds of things happening. There's even a um, we talked about. Uh, online video platforms and using Zoom and, you know, teams and things like that to communicate. Now, there's a group of um, people who uh, inherited a building from a grandparent that I've in a town I've worked with in Florida. And it's one of these classic stories where the building has been vacant forever because uh, these cousins who don't even know each other that well and live in parts of the country can't get together and agree what to do. So, you know, they're not doing anything. All of a sudden with Zoom, they realize, hey, we can all get together on a call with a Main Street manager and maybe an interested developer who would buy out our shares, convert our ownership shares to literal shares in an LLC. Um, and the developer will own 50% and redevelop the building and we'll all get our shares and we can trade them if we want to. So some amazing kind of solutions happening there. I just think it's a great time for us to be aware of uh, what every property owner's needs and interests are and every business owner's needs and interests are and look for those connections and opportunities to maybe begin to place, put things together um, and change some of the ownership things that have kind of snagged development in downtowns for a long time. Absolutely. Now I'm going to ask you a question and if it's too if it's too long an explanation, just tell me that that's a dumb question. <laughs> okay. So, you know, one of the things that has been interesting to me is I live in a community in Delaware where we are about 30 minutes from the beach. Um, and because of that, there's this kind of general knowledge of what kind of rents the beach commands. And it artificially elevates the values of the property in our community, even though we have nowhere close to the foot traffic. Right. So, you know, I kind of had this mindfulness of some of those topics anyway. But now all of a sudden with things like social distancing and with things like with different occupancy um, allowances and things like that, are we going to see a actual change in perceived value of space? Based oh, absolutely. Off of Okay. Absolutely. And, and is it just kind of a chain reaction or is it a forced pain that's going to force, you know, that's going to force that chain? Like, is mm -hmm. it going to require building ownership failures to re-trigger the value? Well, I think it's going to be something actually between those those two things, because what's going to happen, for example, is um, one of the, the genies, I think, is not going back in the bottle after this is working from home and telecommuting. And there are all kinds of studies out already, you know, predicting what that's what that the impact of that is going to be. But the bottom line is probably we're going to be looking at 15 or 20 percent vacant office space. Um, across the country, not just in downtowns, but you know wherever it might be. I think things like office parks are probably you know first on the list to 
doom, but um, it's going to catch up with downtowns. And in a commercial environment, unlike in a residential environment, I, I might be going on too long because you know me and I get talking about stuff like this, but um, oh, basically, <laughs> but the, the value of a commercial space is directly connected to the rent that it can command. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a higher vacancy rate, the building is going to be worth a little bit less. The rent's going to be a little bit lower. If retail sales are in flux, that's going to affect things. So I think we're definitely going to see a softening of property value and a softening yeah. of, of rent. So we'll see. I, I think it's going to be important for us to gravitate towards percentage leases where um, instead of charging whatever the amount would have been in the past in Milford, Delaware, maybe it's, you know, $18 a square foot if you're basing it off of what's happening in Lewis and Bethany, um, yeah. then uh, that might turn out to be a base of 12 dollars a square foot and instead you know charging two percent of the businesses gross sales above a ceiling of 150,000 or 200,000 so that right. the, the, the property owner and the business owner are both committed to making that business succeed and it provides a safer uh, uh, a basement level for the for the business owner and that actually I think that's the perfect segue into the different lease structures just like you were talking about this yeah the, I I am so excited about the idea that um, property ownership comes with it the expectation that you are partners with your tenants that's a that that to me is kind of an amazing um, kind of refresh or reboot on some of that mindset instead of it just being this kind of heartless mindless investment you know for maximized profit when right. there's kind of expectation that no when you're a landlord you're actually in partnership with somebody whether you recognize the partnership or don't kind of determines whether you're a good landlord or not. I mean, right. so, so it's a pretty exciting evolution or I don't even, I mean, I think it's probably the way that things used to be and we just moved away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're going to see a lot of new innovation in this area too. We'll see. Cool. Very cool. Um, ramped up business development. I think that, uh, that the, the process of getting a business um kind of from concept to idea i think a lot of people are fearful that hey we're going to have a lot of vacancies after this and and what do we do to fill those what are you seeing or thinking as it was related to to business development and, and maybe going from concept to yeah to, you know open doors yeah well we've, we've talked about some of this this morning in different uh, dribs and drabs, but um, it's going to have several, I think, major manifestations. One of them is working with individual business owners to help them really recreate their business, to think about it from the beginning as sort of an omni-channel enterprise. Um, and what does that mean? And it could mean that they you know, expand and are beginning to reach customers all over the place or that they focus very tightly on a local need. Um, but I think it's going to mean that of that intensive kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching and training uh, to help businesses kind of reframe themselves to everything from the fact that, you know, we have lost some downtown businesses already, and those were probably the struggling undercapitalized businesses that went first, but that means there might be a vacancy on every si on, 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 on each side of a really good, uh, a thriving business. What would be the best neighbors for that business now? You know, what's the best business to put there? So it's the whole kind of gamut of experiences, but it means a real turn, I think, away from uh, the promotion heavy uh, work plans that a lot of downtown organizations have had to really focusing on what are these business needs? What are the property needs? Because those are going to be the most critical. And that actually that harkens back to one of my absolute favorite presentations that I watched you give where you talked about thinking strategically about your downtown district and about the type of businesses that exist in it. And you talked about how they're anchor businesses, there are comparison businesses and convenience businesses mm -hmm. and the importance of intelligent clustering and, and all that kind of stuff and, and the relationship between parking amenities and certain businesses types. And, and it really does just kind of rekindle that whole thought of strategic shaping of the experience of your place. Love, right. And this love. is this is sort of a reset opportunity where, you know, because there will be some vacancy and there will be some property for sale and all of those different things, some rethinking of public space, we have the opportunities to to kind of move in a new direction. Absolutely. Hadn't it been nice for uh for us to not hear about people complaining about parking for like two days? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> kind of a it's it's a once in a once in a career opportunity for us. So, it is um, fabulous. With that, that kind of carries us into to redesigning design and uh, you know this idea of the role that design plays in our districts. Um, l- let's start a little bit with with pedestrian circulation space. That was something that you added in. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing or what you're thinking there. Well, I'm, you know, I'm thinking sort of in, in I, I don't want to get into detail about this because we could go, you know, down the design path for a long time. But the things I think were just important to sort of mention in design are that we're paying a lot of attention to exterior space now, to having greater pedestrian circulation space, to having bike lanes, uh, mm-hmm. to, you know, all those different things that are kind of popping up, to having the hand washing stations and all of that, parklets. I've There's some great parklets that I've seen that I, I just love. Um, but we also have to think about interior space. And one of the things that I think I've seen businesses not paying a lot of attention to is they're reconfiguring their interior space to make it safer and putting up the plexiglass barriers is they need to be thinking about fulfillment space. If they're really going to be doing online sales and doing more um, delivery and curbside pickup, they're going to need just assembly space someplace in the building uh, to think about. The other thing that I've seen uh, communities so far not giving a whole lot of thought to is climate control. Mm. So, you know, this whole thing happened in the spring and that was probably fortuitous in terms of weather, but now that it's hot, um, I've seen some places that have done, yeah, that have done, um, you know, fans and um, misting stations and stuff like that. But winter is coming, as they say, and we're going to need to um, have things be warmer, too. So uh, it's important to give some thought to that. And that's where I've seen communities not doing too much thinking yet. So I just wanted to. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting talking about that from integrating the fulfillment space. I mean, um, we've even seen some communities that have started talking about whether or not this is creating the whole new, um, it's almost like a new business type of a downtown shipping fulfillment center Mm -hmm. where you're able to take advantage of either single or multiple kind of back storefront spaces, create smaller leasable micro retail up front and then have a business that's actually going around and picking up things that need to be shipped. I mean, there's there's some interesting dynamics, I think, creativity that's coming out of it. And then one of the other things that that you said that I think makes so much sense is just the importance of being able to spill outside, whether you're retail, whether you're restaurant, um, being able to take your product and and spill out, being able to spill your experience out. We've seen the the both the parklets and parking lots being recaptured as dining um, space. We've seen you know uh, places like Denver that are allowing retail to be able to spill out not just in front of their own store, but to actually spill out in front of other property owners. Yeah. And that space is going to be key to us for sure. Right. And yeah. also, it it's also underscoring a lot of the collaboration that's coming out of this, that businesses are working together and thinking, you know, I'd like a little a little visibility for this line of summer clothing that I haven't been able to move. So, you know, could your could your food servers wear some of these things or could I put them in your restaurant window and um, lots of cool stuff. Now, I'm hesitant to ask this because I'm scared. Uh, I, I'm scared of, of even saying it out loud, but um you know, we're all familiar with the the few true success stories like the church streets in, in Burlington, Vermont, and um, the, the pedestrian mall models. Um, we know that there probably were more that failed than succeeded. Um, but are we going to see some sort of maybe a modified adaptation of if we're trying to achieve um, a certain amount of safe distance. Can we achieve both vibrancy and distance in a, a public setting? I mean, are are you? I, I know that we're talking about you know streets being taken from the cars and given back to the people, but I, I also have a certain amount of hesitation. That's like, don't jump back onto the pedestrian mall trend. Like, find the sweet spot. Yeah. Well, so this is a a, 
uh, thing about America um, is that we tend to be black and white thinkers and we don't get the gray zones very well. And I think the reason is that pedestrian malls from the 60s and 70s did fail in the U.S. We had 220 of them at one point and now we only have about 20 left and they're all in places that have high concentrations of people like universities. So we have them in Boulder and we have them in Ann Arbor and we have them in Burlington, Vermont, where Church Street is. Those are the places where they're thriving because they've got 50,000 people right there captured. Um, they didn't work so well in the places like my hometown, Salisbury, Maryland, where you don't have 50,000 people, you know, ever. <laughs> so it's uh, it just didn't work that well. Um, but we need to think about the gray zones. And if you look at European cities, they have these sort of shared streets. There's even a movement called Shared Streets. This guy named Ben Hamilton Bailey uh, promoted for years. Um, and the curbs aren't like American curbs that go up like this and then over, they're they're gradually, they're kind of like this so that cars could actually park on the sidewalk if it's nighttime and nobody is downtown. Um, and you can have the street be used for people in the daytime and then 6 p.m., you know, you can have some cars coming through on one lane. In the middle of the night, you can have delivery trucks there because, you know, it all works. We don't, we don't tend to think in the, that flexible framework here. We tend to be more black and white about it. So I think we need shared streets yep. and not pedestrian malls. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then finally, I think one of the big things that we've seen curbside pickup, it, it has been yeah. adopted almost universally. Um, we've seen really cool promotions around both takeout and, and curbside um, and just, you know, really interesting ways that our local businesses are, are able to um, to still keep keep a revenue stream going and, and provide. But it's also, again, it's changing those dynamics on parking you know it's like hey all of a sudden a parallel space can generate a customer for a one minute interaction right instead of a customer for a 90 minute you know space fill so yeah uh, some interesting dynamics there for sure aren't you glad you want a parking consultant right now i am very very glad <laughs> <I'm> very <laughs> glad so We've been talking for right at an hour, and this kind of brings us down to our, our last section, those lasting impacts. Um, I would love to just reinforce for those of you that are with us today, if you do have any questions, please feel free to, to uh, drop them in the Q&A section. Uh, if you have anything that we didn't cover, anything that you'd like for us just to, to weigh in and pretend like we know about, we're more than happy to do that. But um, with the lasting impacts, uh, you know, one of the big questions I had, Kennedy, was, the things that we're seeing now, what's going to become permanent? Um, you know, with these safety practices, are they temporary practices? Are they, you know, what kind of things do you truly believe are going to become long-term adoptions? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think we're all still like, kind of thinking about that and thinking, oh, there's some real advantages to doing it this way that we hadn't thought about before. You know, you think about other countries and other countries have, you know, routinely used face masks before and um, dining partitions simply as a way of, of preventing transmission of everyday common colds and everything else. So I think that uh, we, if, if we can depoliticize uh, some of these safety practices, um, and think about their their real benefits. I think we might see some of this stick around, uh, some of this. I think the things we're more likely to see stick around have to do with uh, changes in um, what people buy and how they shop. Um, there's certainly people have relaxed a lot about um, alcoholic beverages in in public places and Absolutely. you know all these all these places that are selling you know alcohol through drive through windows now is just a we would we, 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 we never have believed that a year ago or six months ago. Never would have believed it. Um, and now it's here. I think it's hilarious in some ways that um, looking at Walmart's department uh, sales in the first month or two of the pandemic, um, they were selling lots of shirts and no and no slacks or shorts because everybody was now geared towards looking into a webcam um, and only cared about what they look like from here. And Absolutely. not down. So, like, are people not going to buy as many pants? Is it all going to be sweatpants from now on? Who knows? Maybe Brooks Brothers is tanking um, because people are not buying are not buying suits like they were. Right. I, I saw a stat relative. I think it was probably end of April, April 30th, maybe that said that um, we were definitely selling more sweatpants than we were face masks. Right. And I don't think that that surprises anybody. But no, you're exactly right. The whole idea of um, we see a lot of downtowns asking about open container districts 
and uh, seen uh, adopting that a little bit more. The additions of, of beverages to go, uh, as soon as our local uh, Mexican restaurant was able to sell margaritas to go with their food, you know, sales went through the roof. Um, we've even seen, you know, actual cocktail delivery where you can get food delivery and, and cocktail delivery in some places. Um, that definitely changes the economics of that business model um, for those folks with liquor licenses who aren't able to have people congregating at the bar. You know, that definitely does make a difference. Um, yeah. And it is, you know, you mentioned the face masks. And, and again, it's it's hard to talk about without feeling like or having folks feel like you're jumping into a political comment or commentary. But um, a good friend of mine is the deputy director of public health here in Delaware. And the thing that she kept saying to me was, it's going to be amazing if people are still wearing masks come flu season. It's going to be amazing the impacts of how mm -hmm. minimal our flu season could be. Right. And and I'll never forget I, one of the consultants that you and I both know who I won't name um, commented on how he flew in mid-March and um, right when things started to get real bad. And, and um, he kind of made the comment of I've never seen lines in the bathroom before at the scene. And then he was like, mm -hmm. I guess we just kind of know how many people don't normally watch their <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do not want to know who that is. I, so, I know, I know. Yeah. So, um, you There's know, a... just seeing some of those those kind of changes in habits and then changes in consumer expectations is going to be really yeah. interesting. There's there, there's um, um also uh, changes. We've been talking a lot about retail, and I think that's because that's a big piece of what we see in downtowns. But it's affecting, there are changes that are affecting other kinds of businesses too. So I mentioned that I'm married to a psychiatrist. So I've learned a psychiatrist who has an office in the District of Columbia, which is just a mile away, lives in Virginia, and has customers, clients, patients in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. And the licensure issues are crazy complicated. So a psychiatrist with an office in DC until the pandemic could only see see, see, see patients who, uh, who came to that office and they treated in DC. So now mm -hmm. that you suddenly have telehealth, if there's a patient in Maryland, that patient in Maryland can't by telehealth see the doctor in DC. So the states have temporarily loosened up the licensure controls, but there's a big press to make those things permanent. And I've heard the same thing with regard to insurance and a few other uh, industries where those sort of cross cross state barrier issues um, mm -hmm. are gonna become problems that have to get ironed out as we move out of the pandemic. Um, there also are a lot of interesting sales tax issues that are happening, uh, not because of the pandemic, but concurrently that date back from that Wayfair uh, decision of the Supreme Court a few years back that requires mm -hmm. uh, communities, uh, businesses in states, businesses that have sales over $100,000 to collect sales taxes on purchases from out of state customers online. And so all of a sudden you're seeing communities in um, states that are seeing upticks in sales tax because they've got some businesses there that are attracting online sales that are like, hey, at a time when you know our, our budget is struggling because we're trying to put money into small businesses and into social services, we're suddenly seeing a little bit more in retail sales tax revenue that we hadn't thought about. So I think that the location, the, the importance for businesses to be selling things online is gonna become mm -hmm. repressing for local governments. And I think we're gonna see some interesting evolution grow from that too, and that's gonna be a lasting impact. Absolutely. So now, lots of threads. Yeah, I mean, one of the big trends uh, leading into this is we saw a lot of energy and excitement around uh, both co-working spaces and food halls. Right. Um, two two models that that very much depend on <laughs> you know a lot of people in one place. Um, any thoughts, guidance as it relates to either food halls? I know that uh, Cushman put out a a pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, PDF kind of prospectus about the future of food halls. Um, have you seen or heard anything about co-working? Does it does it break those dynamics? Does it adapt them? Or, or are we actually seeing things where it's making it work? Uh, maybe yeah. more so 
a, a traditional office. Well, it, interesting on, on both points, food halls and co-working. So, I mean, again, sort of a, a coincidence is that WeWork began downsizing at exactly the time that the pandemic hit. And so um, we were already losing some co-working space nationally. Um, and they've, and the, and, and, and those that are still here are moving very quickly to go back towards cubicles and having, you know, dividers up so people can still share common amenity, amenities, but be in a safer, a safer environment. I think the jury is still out on how those are going to evolve. Frankly, I'm seeing, a, I'm hearing a lot of different uh, mixed messages. Food halls are kind of interesting because I've, I'm seeing food halls now that are turning into ghost kitchens. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they've got a bunch of restaurants there or they've got, you know, a couple of chefs that can you know, provide food from different cuisines um, and they're using their space to instead package food um, better than independently owned restaurants can in some cases because they know how to climate control, temperature control uh, so that you get your french fries delivered and they're not soggy because they were packaged like it was a piece of chicken or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so they're they're now becoming ghost kitchens and and doing deliveries and increasing deliveries. Um, I was talking to a couple of guys in Houston who opened a food hall just a few months before the pandemic hit, um, intending for it to be a ghost a ghost kitchen. I think it's called Click Robot Run, and mm -hmm. um, and they're they're going gangbusters in this because their their particular physical configuration and business model just happens to work. And so I think we're we could see you know, a little bit more of that happening too. And this is a random side question, but it, it does kind of stitch together some of the stuff that we talked about. Um, and, and I might actually make it relevant um, depending on what you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, our America's home builders have always been very responsive to trends, um, maybe a little earlier than other industries where they are. They'll sit there and they'll, you know, it's like a movie room started to become, you know, pretty standard in certain things. And then they moved on to that giant kitchen island and that kind of stuff. Um, are we going to see residential trends that change? you know, is a quote office that could have been an office or could have been a bedroom. Like, are we going to see Zoom rooms? Are we going to see things integrated into homes that allow multiple members of the home to video conference simultaneously? And if so, does that change the way down the road that community members might might interact like if it truly becomes integrated into the home then are we going to see committee meetings that are almost all virtual just because it's not worth the the time yeah. anymore any other way like are are you hearing or seeing any kind of hints at residential integration well i mean the one thing that you hear a lot about is the importance of home offices now and that people who hadn't really invested a whole lot of thought into what you know what a home office situation might look like are now putting a lot of thought into it and so i suspect we'll see homes have rooms that are more flexible um mm -hmm. certainly having good distributed broadband is going to be more important because if you've got a kid who's doing online classes and you've got two working parents who are you know each doing their video conferences it's a pretty heavy heavy load um beyond that i think i'm i'm just hearing a lot of speculation at this point about and that sort of blends into the whole density thing about is multifamily maybe not the way we should be going in the future and blah 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 so i think it's just a lot of speculation really but i think a zoom room i haven't heard that i kind of like it you can have a dual use for those movie studios i guess those movie theaters that you have in your basement but um right. definitely home offices there's going to be a lot more attention there i mean i i sit there and just like you described i mean we've got five kids so there are very definitely days where my wife is in class, my kids are all in class, and I'm trying to have a meeting. And it, it's yeah. luckily there's a table for each person. But you know, it, it is a it's an interesting dynamic that could be a new normal for some. Right. So um, let's see. I tell you what, we have definitely. I feel like we have gone through and kind of covered that. Um, again, I'd love to invite any of our participants. If, if you do have anything that you would like for Kennedy or I to, to jump in on, please feel free to uh, put that in the, the, the Q&A section. Um, and Kennedy, I just I want to thank you every single time I hear you. I, I just continue to um, to be impressed with just the there's this kind of way that you look at the systems of the way that everything kind of works and it's so so refreshing to 
to kind of feel like you're talking to somebody who's in command of this ecosystem. It's not just a single thing. And um, and I love that because, you know, from our end, we love downtowns and it's it, it's easy to get kind of bogged down or even get a little depressed about oh, it just seems so hard. Everything just seems so hard, but it is it's so cool to hear the different systematic approaches and, and the the creativity that people are using. And the reason that they're using that creativity is because these places inherently work and they're worthy of the reinvention. Yeah, you know, I mean, downtowns have always worked. They've always been sort of self-supporting economic ecosystems until we started screwing them up in the 50s and 60s by doing crazy things like building too much retail space and putting in, you know, single-use pedestrian streets and stuff like that. Um, and I think that this, the pandemic, you know, as tragic as it is, it is a huge reset and it's causing everybody to rethink uh, what's going to make things work better. And that's, I think, ultimately going to put us in a better place in five or 10 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, we've been going for about an hour and 15. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to grab lunch before they are back on with you. Uh, Kennedy, you are coming back at uh, uh, one o'clock central, two o'clock Eastern, right? right. Um, and you're going to be talking about the, the future of retail. And yeah. uh, I'm really, really excited about hearing about that. Um, for those of you that are with us today, just want to, to remind you that we have recorded the section um, and or the session, I should say. We will be sharing that with you all through the Iowa Downtown Center YouTube page. And we have also uploaded a uh, PDF of the presentation if there are any photo examples that you wanted to go back and, and take a look at. And um, I want to thank you all for your time and your attention uh, coming out and listen to us. And I want to uh, turn it back over to Carol. And um, and I know I kind of took care of her housekeeping for her, but um, but we're going to let uh, let Carol reinforce anything that I might have missed. And uh, and then um, hopefully we will see you all later on today. Carol, I can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. We appreciate your insight. All I can say is, wow, my head is spinning. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this because you you both provide a lot of great information and good ideas and just really thoughtful things for all of us to be thinking about. So I can't wait to hear each one of you um, later on today. As Ben said, Kennedy will be up next at one o'clock our time uh, and then Ben will be at 2.15. So we've got some great sessions lined up for you yet today. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Um, as Ben said, grab some lunch. And remember, um, each session is unique. So for those of you that are watching, you need to make sure you go back to that program and log in through the, through the link for each session. So we hope to see y'all uh, at one o'clock.